Um, Nicola asked me to come and talk to you about um, communication um, uh, and citizen science projects, and I did hold my hand up immediately and say, I'm not an expert in this. I don't consider myself to be uh, in any shape or form um, any kind of expert on, on, on media, but I do have expertise in citizen science, and we've been working in this area for about four to five years now. Um, so I've, I've kind of, by osmosis, really picked up a fair bit of what not to do and what to do, um, and I can reflect back my experiences more than anything else. So I'm not here as a as an oracle on this subject by any stretch of the imagination. So I thought I'd give you a bit of uh, context about our projects to start off with, because you may not have um, come across any of these. So um, just to give you a bit of background, um, as I said, I. I I started off doing these projects um, within the University of Bristol and we set up this program called Nature Locator which uh, itself is now a kind of umbrella for a whole range of different citizen science based uh, projects. So these are all essentially smartphone app based projects with supporting websites that are there for the sort of typical public engagement crowdsourcing of um, high quality scientific data. So the ethos is we make it as simple as possible for people to, to take part in these projects um, and really we spend a lot of time focusing on how we can extract the best quality of data from people that don't actually necessarily know anything about the subject so that we don't just end up with you know piles and piles of data that we can't use. Um, the, this is a handful of the projects we've got. Um, I will um, well, come and talk to me afterwards and I'll point you in the direction of the actual um, Nature Locator site and you can then go and have a look at the, uh, the sort of full range. But um, these, these are all sort of centred around, um, we've got quite a few around invasive species um, and we've got some, some um, projects there that we run in collaboration with the Biological Record Centre. Uh, I record butterflies is done with uh, butterfly conservation. Mammal society also involved in mammal tracker, etc. So uh, there are some good support uh, organisations <coughs> behind these as well. So effectively, what we do, we work with uh, researchers, organisations, uh, and we look at how we can engage uh, the public with the data collection side of things. As I said, with this kind of slant on making sure the data is good quality, and we do that by designing these bespoke smartphone apps and websites. Um, innovation, I've, I've, I'm almost on the verge of taking that out because actually what we do now is not really innovative at all. It's pretty par for the course. Um, really the only thing that we do that um, has been innovative recently is the Batmobile project, which you may have seen that's up there. That is the only project that's not out there in the public domain at the moment because it never reached the point that it was good enough. Um, or generated good enough data for us to really um, to, to take that step. Uh, we spent most of the money on the um, on, on the name as well, rather than the project itself. Uh, that is a joke. Um, so the public engagement side is the critical bit. That's the bit that we're really focused on. We're really interested in how do we make these projects accessible and interesting to people. And I think by root of that a lot of the, the engagement and, and the media side sort of comes along quite naturally. So in, in some situations we've been very fortunate with the engagement with uh, the media, but I'll come on to that a bit later on. So what these things look like, um, if you've never seen them before, we, um, we concentrate a lot on the design. So we spend quite a lot of money on design and I think that's important uh, because these are out there for um, everyone to use, they have to look nice, they have to feel right, the usability aspect has to be correct, otherwise people will just get bogged down and they won't go back and use it again. So we do um, deliberate over the design and the UX side of these projects um, quite, quite excessively sometimes. And like I said, we've got supporting websites, so this is the bit that really surfaces the information back to the public, so the, the apps are really the data collection element. Uh, and then the websites are more there for people to go and then examine the data that's being collected. So there's a sort of um, unprovoked engagement there. We're not prodding people really to get involved with that, but it's there for people to investigate, download the data, uh, and read blogs, that sort of thing. So um, 
the actual content of my presentation about media and communications is this bit. Um, an unusual title perhaps, but it has a lot of relevance to um, some of our experiences with uh, mass media um, with, our, with our projects. So I thought we'd have a look at why you want media coverage in the first place, we being all of us, when we're running these uh, kind of projects. And a lot of this is just common sense, it's obvious stuff, but I thought it was worth just going through some of the, 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 key, um, the, the key points. So one of, the, one of the top ones, and really I've almost listed these in terms of selfish through to altruistic on this slide. So often at the forefront it's about us and getting what we're doing noticed, shouting about you know, our project. And a lot of that is, is to do with the fact we want it to succeed, but a lot of that is also to do with the fact that you know, we're quite perhaps proud of what we've done and we want people to notice what we're up to. And for a business, that's very important as well, because you want people to notice uh, the good stuff that you're doing. You want to engage volunteers. So with citizen science, you can't have a citizen science project if you haven't got any citizen scientists. So you know, getting the message out there is fundamental to the, the whole project. Um, attracting more funding, uh, that is a big thing for, for ev everyone, really. Um, in a university context, um, a lot of us are on project funding, so if we don't get more projects in, we're out of the job. So, you know, it's a, it's a critical aspect again. Um, success metrics, people measure us on how many people we have engaged in our project, how many people have seen it, how many people have participated. Um, and your impact, if you're a researcher, is measured by the engagement element now as well to some extent. So there's that element of personal satisfaction. I mean, I find that quite a, quite an important thing. I, you know, I'm quite proud of the work that, that we've done. I don't want to push anything out the door that's not up to standard. And it's nice to see that people um, appreciate some of the things that you've done and they're useful. So, uh, but then we get into the more altruistic side of things, um, increasing knowledge of a subject or problem. So invasive plant species, one of the things that we're finding with that plant tracker project is that people are now starting to uh, feed back to us that they had no interest or knowledge of this subject before but now they're, they're you know they're, they're real convertees to the cause and they're out there every weekend with their dog recording invasive plant species I'm not sure what the dog contributes but um, and finding solutions to problems citizen science is increasingly being used to find solutions to difficult problems that individual teams of scientists don't necessarily have the resource or time to, to, to find problems to. So there have been all sorts of things about you know, the, um, the examination of proteins and they gamified the, um, uh, the, 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 the problem so that uh, people out there actually provide them with solutions without really actually being aware that they're doing it that they are aware, but you need not be aware that you were doing it for the project to work. And inspiring interest as well, you know, we, we're probably all very passionate about the things that we're working on, and we want other people to be passionate about them, to understand uh, the issues, and perhaps we might even just trigger that, in, uh, that, that kind of inspiration in someone that serves to, um, to lead them into a new career. But the, the crux of the matter really is um, that media coverage itself isn't always appropriate. Um, I don't think that it's, it's particularly necessary for a lot of citizen science projects in the typical way that we all envisage it, which is coverage on the BBC or uh, you know, get it, you're getting on the TV or in the big media publications, The Guardian, The Times, that sort of thing. So the, the key thing really with projects is if it's not ready, um, the media coverage is just going to be a, a pain. It's going to be a problem for you. And there, there have been quite a lot of examples of this. Um, and some of them have been very, very successful in terms of media coverage. Um, there's a project called Ashtag, which I'm sure a lot of you are aware of um, here, which was done more or less um, as a media stunt, really, uh, on the surface of it. The organisation that was using the data wasn't ready. The data wasn't quite ready for them. Um, and they had lots of problems with data not being verified because no one was there set up ready to do it. 
so then you had this kind of backlog and people that were submitting data got disillusioned because no one was looking at their data and the, the, the feedback loop wasn't there, it wasn't set up. So, but they had to do it at that time because they had to capture the moment. So um, it's a tricky one, but I'm all, I always verge on the, um, on the cautious side with this and I won't tend to try and advertise anything until it's really ready and tested and we know it's gonna work. Um, mass media. Uh, we've got quite a few projects that are featured in, in things like the Guardian, the Times, and Stephen Fry tweeted one of our projects really early on in our sort of um, foray into citizen science, and it's it's brilliant. It's lovely to have that, uh, but the problem well, it's not a problem, but the, the knock-on effect, and I suppose the obvious um, the obvious thing with mass media like that is it's a point in time it causes a big spike in interest, and then it just drops off completely the other side. So. In terms of the net gain that you get from it as a project that's got a long-term vision, I'm not sure quite what it's going to give you. It's, it's obviously some help, but is it a lot of help? I don't know. And I think a lot of that comes down to what you do after that. Um, oh, the other point is that it's very unfocused normally about the audience, and citizen science projects are normally quite specific, and you need a specific kind of person to engage on that or with that project. Um, Micromedia, as I've termed it here, I'm not really quite sure how you would want to um, to group the, the, the type of um, social media type of marketing tools together, but it seems like an appropriate um, term. So things like Facebook, Twitter, those kind of micro-blogging type um, applications. Going to events like this one, uh, going to conferences that are specifically focused on a particular topic, um, I found to be much, much better at the long-term engagement side of things. <clears throat> and critically for us, because we're interested in the data, the data that you get from those type of um, targeted users is much, much better. As an example of that, um, has anyone heard of John Hogweed? Mm -hmm. Yeah? And were you aware of the big media kind of... Uh, Ferrari around it back in July. Did you come across it? I'm not sure whether it was such a such a thing up here, but down south we had loads of newspapers picking up on it. It was like a rash. Slightly inappropriate. Um, <laughs> anyway, um, it um, it led to us getting more giant hogweed records through plant tracking than we've ever had. Excellent. Lots of people engaged, found the app, and, and said this is brilliant. Uh, the problem was that 80% of the data that we got on giant hogweed was incorrect. Uh, and that is quite astounding given that the data quality that we get through Plant Tracker normally is around 90% accurate. So a complete reverse. So it was due to just, you know, lots of people finding out about giant hogweed and then every time they saw something that looks like giant hogweed, regardless of whether it was two inches tall or six feet tall, uh, we would get a record of it. Not necessarily a problem, uh, but it just goes to show that for your purposes as perhaps a data-centric project, it may not be what you need. So we find the drip feeding is better. The constant effort, okay, it's a bit of a pain. You've got to spend a lot of time and effort on this, um, but it works better. That kind of engage the smaller minority that have an interest and perhaps some kind of um, experience in this area and retain them. Um, but as I say, any publicity is good pub publicity. Um, I don't know about that, is it really? I'm not sure. Um, some of the things that we've had as a result of publicity have um, they've generally been very positive, but we've had a few things that have, have kind of been uh, slightly more problematic as a result of it. Um, so to use a fishing analogy, apologies for this, but um, I always see the mass media thing like ground baiting. So this is where you chuck stuff into the water to kind of spur interest and, and cause a bit of a feeding frenzy. And then you need to be more targeted with what you put on your hook if you're actually going to catch the fish. So the ground baiting kind of stirs up the interest. Uh, but then you've got, to, um, you've got to think quite carefully about the follow-up, what you're doing to... Um, draw in the appropriate audience. So um, with the big media coverage that our first project got, which was uh, Leafwatch, 
Um, we did have some unusual things coming through being submitted by the app. Um, we had uh, we worked with a scientist at the University of Bristol with this who for a couple of years had been running this project online um, using paper-based records. And they'd had about 500 records in a good year coming through, all of which they couldn't verify because there were no photographs. Um, a lot of times people just put in generalised locations. I'm in Chippenham rather than a, a grid reference, so it was you know, nigh on useless for them to, to really tie things down. Uh, so we designed a smartphone app that geolocated things accurately and people submitted a photograph, so everything was verifiable. And we had, within three months, 5,000 records coming through. But a fair proportion of those, not, not a huge number, but we did get some quite interesting and amusing... Uh, it was amusing for a while. Um, but then, yeah, you start to think, are we doing something wrong here? Do we need to... Uh, to refocus this because we've got all sorts of things getting submitted, um, definitely a few bottoms. Um, if anyone ever watched the in-betweeners where the guy put the thong on and pranced about on stage, I'm not going to go any further than that, but we, we had an image which left nothing to the imagination coming through, but he did geolocate where he was, so that was good, and put his email address in, so I'm not sure whether he was trying to tell us something. Um, so we have all sorts of things coming through, uh, including smirts, um, which is quite sweet, but not very useful. Um, so on to the bit about how to attract publicity. This is the bit that I'm not really clear about, and um, Ali will be able to help um, far more with, I would imagine. Um, disclaimer, I'm no expert, already said that. Um, but Often it's about finding an interesting story. Some of our projects on the surface of it are quite dull sounding, but actually there's normally a conservation story underneath that's quite important. So it's about trying to find, there's another fishing analogy, I, that wasn't intentional. Um, it's about trying to find that hook to draw people in. What are they, you know, what's going to trigger off people's imagination? It's fairly obvious stuff. And certainly with the projects that we did within the University of Bristol, it was the public relations office that normally got us the the gig, you know, it was normally them because they've got such an established wide network of people that were able to uh, draw in further interest from newspapers. Me on my own using my Twitter feed, you know, I don't really stand a chance. No one, no one's really reading that. There are a few people, but it's 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 highly unlikely that someone from the Times is going to look at it and pick up on it and phone me. So um, utilize your existing resources in an institution like this because there are quite a lot of them do wield quite a bit of um, power. Don't tell them that, they won't get big-headed. Um, and one of my colleagues is very good at researching journalists, so he'll hunt the journalists down and he'll put the stories right under their nose, which is probably quite a good thing to do, because we're all busy. Um, journalists often don't have the time to go out and look for a good story. So if you can actually provide it to them in a timely manner when something else is happening that's related to that project, brilliant. You know, why wouldn't they look? And the last bit is ignore me and listen to what Ali says, because, hey, what do I know? But, you know, that, that basically... That's about it, really. Oh, OK. <laughs> that kind of summarises, for me, really, our experience of the whole thing. A lot of it feels quite random. Uh, but I think underneath, when you look at it, it's, it's a combination of events coming together. And it is often about that story and, and concurrent events happening out in the wide world, like giant hogweed suddenly piquing the interest because a couple of people have been really badly burned by it, that sort of thing. You know, it's um, looking for those um, those opportunities, really, to, um, to, to tell your story to an audience that's ready to listen. Um, if you want to find out any more about our projects, um, just drop me an email or talk to me afterwards. I'll be around for a while, so more than happy to share any other experiences with you. I can't show you those photographs, unfortunately, because I had to delete them. I believe I saw um, one of them actually. Oh, so, good for uh, Yeah, Did no, you? I didn't. Really? Yeah. Oh. Um, You're lucky to have missed one. Yeah. So um, that's it, basically. Any questions? Do you want questions at this point or after? Uh, I'm more than happy to. Um, thank Bye. you very much. That's brilliant. Um, <laughs> I think Ali's already introduced himself as well, but Ali comes to us from STV, but other things as well. So um, I assume yeah. you can bring in your collective knowledge from these different. Yes. Community projects. Yes, yeah, well. so I've done a little bit of citizen or well, citizen campaigning. It's not quite citizen science, but certainly community development type thing. So, oh, um, 
Anyway, here we are, yes. Who am I? Uh, I work for STV as a journalist now, um, but I have a background in the environment and public sector. Um, so, for example, I, in a previous life I set up a thing with Glasgow Community Safety Services where we got um, volunteers to evaluate the quality of their local neighbourhood in a bid to try and avoid having to pay some expensive consultants for it. And we, you know, my, actually my MSC thesis was on was proving that volunteers could do that just as well as expensive consultants. Um, I've since obviously gone on to STV and currently, with probably completely irrelevant to this project, is I'm also involved in setting up a fledgling investigative news site, which you should all go and check out at fairfair.scot. Uh, fair um, but more importantly, um, I wanted to set, um, I suppose it's helpful to set the context really of what we mean by mass media and engaging with the media. Uh, I said at the top there many newspapers are losing 10% circulation a year. I don't, I don't put that up to be mean because I work for a TV company. Um, it's, it's, it's a fact broadcast TV is doing slightly better but everybody is still converging online. You know more and more people are watching TV in uh, you know not in a linear fashion if you like there's very few occasions other than Strictly Come Dancing when everybody comes together and watches a program on telly together. Uh, and so what we're seeing is uh, things are partly becoming more fragmented, but the companies which are investing in a big online presence have quite a lot of reach. So for example, the STV Facebook pages can reach, collectively can reach a couple of million people in, you know, in a day. So um, there's still a, a lot of good reasons as we like to, for, getting the, for uh, getting the word out there. Um, and I suppose it's worth thinking about when you're planning your project. And, you know, I was thinking about stages of where citizen science projects might want to engage with people. And you identified, as you say, the, the recruitment phase, if you like, getting started. Um, you know, it's worth bearing in mind where you're going to find, the, as you said, the, you know, where you're going to find the people who you're going to most want to be the, be the citizen scientists. So it's worth bearing in mind that more and more people get their news through social networks, more and more people read the news or digest their news through mobile mobile phones, whether that's apps or just online. Um, and increasingly, I think this is an important thing to bear in mind, is that it's becoming more visual. So, you know, 2,000 words is is probably too long, <laughs> you know, for almost anything now. Uh, and, you know, so little short videos, lots of images, infographics, interactive graphics. Uh, that, that work on a mobile phone, it's really challenging and what you, you, and, you know, that's one of the reasons why you look at, well, you know, while, whilst it is possible to do some quite impressive interactive graphics online, you'll find a lot of big media companies don't do much of it simply because it's very hard to get them to scale down to the size of an iPhone screen and get them, you know, and make them load quickly. So um, lots of things to unpack just in thinking about how you're going to communicate and how you're going to reach people. Um, as I say, I've, I've tried to think about sort of three phases before, just simply split it up into before, during the project and afterwards. Um, so it is worth thinking about who you want to reach and this, this would influence not just the media companies or the journalists that you want to engage, but also the social networks that you want to use too. I mean, I think you want to, I, I would suggest that you want to plan a sort of integrated campaign. So for example, if you wanted to work with young people, you know, there's not a teenager in Scotland that doesn't have an Instagram account. Um, and it's a very visual medium, so it could be quite good for some of the projects that you were talking about, for example. Um, in terms of pitching it to the media, what we want to know at the start of a project is, you know, what 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 do people get out of taking part? Um, you know, do they get do they get a Raspberry Pi? <laughs> do they get some clever gadget that they get to walk walk, walk about with? Um, you know, what's obviously what's a long term goal? Is there an interesting backstory? You were talking about some of the conservation stories. It's really important to try and pull out those those things and think about the change that the project is going to bring about. What, what you know, what is the impact that you hope will be, in, and uh, hopefully that you can pull people pull people along with that, if you like. Um, the other thing is to think about a communication can, calendar to start off with from the outset. Think about you know, is your project going to coincide with Back to the Future Day, more of that later. Uh, for example, is it, is it going to coincide with International Authors Day or something which is going to be re relevant to your project? Um, because that's an obvious hook and it could be a good day to launch. Um, 
uh, and you know editors are always going to be looking for a new angle. So if, if there's something happening locally in their area, which is any, you know a local, for example, a local angle on a national news story that you can tell is going to come up, then it's worth bearing that in mind and planning that into your calendar, even if it doesn't quite fit with your launch. You know, you might have started recruiting people at conferences or whatever beforehand, but you know, you might know that something's coming up in you know one month into a three month project. Plan your plan your big big day for then if you like. The other thing that's worth thinking about, which is the last point, is it's not you know it's not really a press release is nice to get. A press release with some bells and whistles attached to it is even better, and I'll touch on that. But at the planning stage, it's worth thinking about what kind of information am I going to collect? How can I process it to produce something which is going to work well visually? You know, is there a, is there a wee infographic that you that you know you're going to have? Because you can start telling journalists about that. You know, why, why would I engage with this project now? Well, you can say, well, at the end of it, we're going to have some quite interesting stuff which could make, you know, a fun story for people later on, and this is the kind of stuff that we hope to produce. So it's not just about the research outputs, it's also about sort of, for want of a better expression, the infotainment <laughs> outputs, if you like. What's going to, you know, the engaging stuff that's going to tell the story of the, of, of you know, whatever it is you discover. And that could be, it could be something as simple as a slideshow, it could be a bunch of, I don't know animated gifs. It could be, it could be data that we could map. It could be you know, so. For example, you know, I was trying to think of citizen science stuff that I've already worked with, and actually, it's fairly slim pickings. But I do remember somebody did a project on um, on uh, happiness and the, with the relative happiness of how people felt in different neighbourhoods around Scotland. And uh, after a bit of um, after a bit of persuasion, we did manage to get them to give us the data. And the, I suppose what. In terms of digital assets, if you do want people to produce maps or help you produce maps, there are some pretty skilled journalists out there, but they're going to need things like the shape files so that they can um, produce a map. You know, it's all very well saying here's the data. You know, if you've got areas, you need, we need to be able to map the areas in a form which isn't copyrighted. Quite often, public sector organisations work with mapping products which have really prohibitive licence terms, or they think they do. And, uh, and so, and so, you know, there, there is a, you know, think about how can we publish that kind of supporting data as well as the, the outputs from the project to support perhaps more interesting and proactive stuff. So, during, assuming you've had a nice launch and you've had a little, a little boost, um, citizen engagement is can be about more than just the research. I'm sure, you know that. Obviously, you know, in terms of in, impact. As simple, simple as identifying a hashtag which hasn't been used before or isn't associated with anything else unfortunate um, is, is worth thinking about. Um, if you have already engaged with journalists, give them progress reports, even if it's just a direct message to say, hey, check out this photo, look, this is still happening. You know, this is one of the things which came in on the hashtag. Chances are journalists won't be following the hashtag all the time unless it's a really short life. You know, it could be a project which happens over 48 hours. So it might be something, you know, if you can generate a big enough social media buzz, that's something that's going to persuade an editor to say, oh, right, hang on a minute. You know, if, if an editor can see there's been 50,000 tweets about this particular subject, sponta apparently spontaneously, if you like, without any push from the mainstream media, it's going to be much more likely that they're going to be interested in writing a story about it at some point. So it's worth thinking about, if you like, building a social buzz in to your project as you go. Um, so that when, so, you know, when increasingly digital newsrooms are driven by those kind of metrics if you like so if you've got you know if you've got a project hashtag and we can go oh that's had seven thousand engagements in the last week we're going to think much more favorably towards writing a story about it quite frankly <coughs> sounds a bit mercenary but that's that's the way it goes um and i suppose the last thing to think about is are there things that cannot be shared there may be child protection issues there may be copyright issues as i've said um, perhaps they should have been on the previous slide, but certainly, you know, there might be things that as, you know, as you pull in stuff into, you know, you might find a way of aggregating things which get posted on a hashtag. You might want to think about something which you can um, quietly, quietly not include a means of, uh, you know, a means of editing what comes through before you present it to a journalist. And there are tools out there which, you know, things like, um, heaven, but mine's gone completely blank. Storify. Storify, thank you. There are things like Storify, which you can use 
which will allow you to curate the best of the social media buzz, which again is something that you can link to as part of a subsequent press release. Um, I mean, I think from certainly from my point of view, often the point to engage the media that was most interest as a journalist is when you found out something interesting, <laughs> you know, um, as as a researcher. So, what difference has the study made? Um, and also, you know, the news thrives on thrives on a bit of drama and potentially a bit of conflict. So, for example, some of the a good example I can think of is uh, Neve Short from Crash, who's uh, the She's a geographer uh, in this university, and uh, you know not only does she do the research, she looks into the relationships between uh, the, you know, the, the number of alcohol sellers and tobacco sellers. She also, you know, she also takes those results and she takes them to the Hollywood Committee and asks for changes in policy. So there's a really good reason for us to cover her her data. Um, that wasn't in this particular incident. It wasn't citizen science. You know, it was a straight research project, but. She's a really good example, I suppose, of a sort of almost like a campaigning academic, um, where she's acting as a sort of expert advocate for the, and taking the results of her study, in you know further into public life, and that's certainly something that we you know we're interested in, in interested in covering. So if you know if you come up, I can imagine, for example, a crowdsource project on air quality, for example, or air pollution, <coughs> where a lot of people get together and discover that there's a whole load of air pollution which official sources haven't picked up yet. You know, there's a case there to engage with people who want that, you know, who want action on that, or to engage with, you know, wider experts to say, now that we've got this data, what are we going to do with it? Too often we tend, you know, the, the, too often we get press releases from people who say, well, we did this study, the result might mean this, or it might mean, or actually we probably need to do a bit more research before we can say anything about it. But, oh well, that's nice. Carry on. Come back to me when you've got a concrete story. You know, so it you know it helps if you can. And, and, and you know, as as somebody with, with a science degree, I know that's how science papers are frequently written. <laughs> but, but you know, don't hedge your bets, if you like. Um, I'm going to say something about press releases, even though it might seem quite old media or old school. But they are, you know, they are fundamentally quite useful. Um, do send them out. Um, do send them out, but make sure that they're fairly short. Make sure they've got multiple quotes, and I think it comes back to this idea of, you know, a clear top line. What's the consequence of what you've done? Um, and lastly, you know, what interesting stuff can you send with it? Um, it sounds funny to ask for visuals in different formats. Forgive me if this is really practical, uh, but you know, a landscape photograph. Uh, a lot of apps require sort of sixteen by nine format for the header headers. Um, image of a story, but <coughs> for example, other social networks function really well with square images. Instagram, for example, if we were going to post a story to Instagram, if we're going to share the story to Pinterest, we want a, a portrait photograph. If you can make our jobs a lot easier by supplying images in all these different formats, um, then it's much more likely that we're going to say, well, here's actually something that we can package up really quickly and fire out really quickly, without having to phone you back up again saying, have you got this? You know, do we have to send somebody out? Are we really, you know, is the story that important to us that we're going to send somebody out to take 15 other extra images? Probably not. So it's quite helpful if you can supply that kind of thing. Um, that said, obviously if you send an email which has got six gigabytes worth of attachments, it's going to get blocked. So uh, a, short, a short press release with links to these things elsewhere is the best way to do it. And please don't send things in PDFs. <laughs> uh, <laughs> oh, that's come off the page. Anyway. Um, just to echo what you've already said, um, do send a press release to generic email addresses. They're relatively easy to find. But um, you may well find that, you, especially if you're doing something quite specific or you want to target a specific audience, that you're much better targeting, you know, finding journalists which are interested in what you want to do, um, interested in what you're doing, uh, and do find just find them on Twitter and send them a direct message. Most people are delighted to have that. Uh, provided your press office allows it and doesn't get annoyed with you for doing it. <coughs> but, um, you know, I, th I think the other thing is, you know, it's actually really helpful if you send, you know, this, this photo call is happening where we're going to celebrate the results of our project. Um, do send an advance warning that that's going to happen, especially if you want things like broadcast TV, you know, don't organise it for the weekend, which is quite often what happens, organise it for a time 
when cameras can get out. And I know this sounds really basic, but it's uh, <laughs> you know you'd be surprised how many people say we're having we're concluding our project for the community event on Sunday afternoon. No TV cameras are going to come, frankly. Uh, so you know, organize it for lunchtime on a weekday. Uh, practical stuff like that, and then if nobody turns up, don't worry about sending a but here's all the pictures anyway kind of press release. Because often, often people might not turn up, it's not because they don't want to turn up, it's just they haven't got the resource. Um, so if you can make it easy for people, they will. Um, and I suppose I shouldn't be really saying this, but if there is one place that you really, really want to be featured in, you know, whether it's a, you know, the local, a local website or local TV program or whatever, offer them as an exclusive and see what they say and actually enter into a negotiation about that. Because you might find that, you know, that sets the agenda and other media organisations will follow afterwards. Obviously, I would like that. I'd like it if that was me that you offer the exclusive to. But, um, you know, that's one way to think about it too. So if you can keep something useful back, which you know is going to be a good news line, consider, consider whether you can offer it to a, a journalist who you know, you know, who's maybe engaged with you all the way through the process or is definitely going to be interested or has got an audience that you need. <coughs> consider offering it to them as an exclusive because again that's more likely to get coverage and humour works so if you can find something daft some kind of funny hook or present it kind of funny you know um, yesterday was Back to the Future Day this story was the second most shared story on our website it's had from yesterday we published it about 1 o'clock it's had 2,600 shares before I left the office <coughs> it's just silly it's just a bunch of it's somebody else who set up a Twitter account putting Glaswegian quotes underneath stills from Back to the Future. But I think uh, it just goes to show that humour goes a long way. You know, the most read story ever on the STD website this year was a story about a guy who, a very tall man who, who uh, used a toilet in a restaurant where they had installed the hand dryer over the toilet. Uh, and he triggered the hand dryer and got into a bit of a mess. And, and that ended up almost on the front page of Reddit. Um, and so, you know, these kind of silly, these kind of silly, often we can be too serious, I think. You know, and, uh, and I think if you can find a funny angle, if you can find funny things for participants to do as they take part in the, in the project, you may well be able to say, here are the 15 funniest things that happened whilst we did this research. Which could be, again, a, you know, a useful follow-up. For example, and it may mean that you're more likely to get engagement. Even if the mainstream media don't cover it, if you put it on your own website, you may find that it gets a hell of a lot more shares than the, you know, and more more interest in the project than just doing here's here's what we found out, the straight story. So, on that note, I shall stop there. <laughs>